Introducing the Nexus 360, D'Addario's first rechargeable omnidirectional tuner. Visible at every turn, from any angle, no matter where you wind up. Nexus 360, built for your next stage. Hey, this is John Bollinger with Premier Guitar. I'm at the Ascend Amphitheater in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm with Taylor Locke of the band Train. Taylor, thanks for joining us, man. This is an honor. I'm a fan. I've <laughs> watched every single episode. This is a moment of, of arrival for me. I think oh, well. I could I could probably leave this gig after we do this. <laughs> I only just wanted to get a rundown. <laughs> well, um, that is too kind. Well, I think everybody is a fan of Train. Who doesn't love Train? And even if they don't think they do, then they're reminded of, of the catalog. Oh, God, man. It's like everybody's soundtrack. Yeah. It is, it, it, anyway, it's got to be a thrill to play those songs it's every It's great, night. yeah. I'm relatively new. I came in and toured last summer, and we did an album, and then we do a lot of private shows, and then this is my first uh, tour of this scale. Right. It's amazing. It's fabulous. Really well, I'm cool. so glad you're here today. Yeah. Hey, we were just, okay, before the camera started rolling, we were, we we're both lovers of P90s. So tell me, is this your number one guitar? This guitar uh, I bought brand new almost 20 years ago from the custom shop. Wow. So it's like a 50s style special. None of this is fake relicking, that's all. High mileage. Been around the world with me in my 20s a few times. And this is kind of the main now. Um, for There's a lot of song specific guitars that are sure. tricked out with certain uh, tunings or other things but for standard tuning electric songs it's between this and another Les Paul which I'll show you yeah hey before you put this one yeah, away yeah. though tell oh, you yeah, about yeah. the bridge is it is that just a it's, straight wraparound yep is it? yep every single thing on this guitar was bone stock from the custom shop except about 20 years ago they were phasing out the bone nuts and they hadn't uh, come up with the new synthetic version yet yeah so a guy in LA just made this out of a uh, nylon and then 20 years later my tech Stefan said that the gears and the tuning pegs were pretty stripped yeah. so we put those in storage and put fresh ones on but other than the tuners and the nut this is exactly as uh, I got it 20 years ago from the custom shop well that's great and we yeah. were talking about the magic of P90s, P90s and yeah. how that they have that uh, I mean there's a little bit of noise issue I don't mind it, you know, you just, I mean, I've played in, you know, dirty clubs my whole life where it's like, nah, the noise is louder than the notes. So you just gotta, <laughs> whether it's a volume pedal or a tuner pedal or here, right. that just becomes part of your technique is being yeah. off when you're not doing it. And if it's really bad, we'll go to a, a humbucker guitar and yeah. we have a noise gate in the rack and if if I can feel it, then it's it's too much. Sometimes Stefan will, will ride it um, in real time, but sure. I don't know. I don't have problems with it. I don't worry about yeah. the noise. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. On a show like this, if there's some moment that's uh, you know a vocal moment, or it's if, if you need to be quiet, you need to be quiet. There's right. no in between. <laughs> you know, it's not. Uh, yeah. There's no buzzing. Yeah. Know? So yeah. whether it's a volume pedal, a tuner pedal here or the gate, you have to deal with it somewhere. Right. Or right. else you're in trouble and people yeah. are looking around. It's not cool. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so, well I love that one. Yeah. Thanks. So when I came into this gig, I, I had worked with Gibson for a number of years and Train had also worked with Gibson for a number of years. So when we joined forces, uh Ray Ann who works at Gibson, hi if she's watching, gave me this uh, gift. Oh, which is a, wow. uh, 50, uh, an R7, Custom Shop 57. Oh, fat, with the medallion, right? Yes, Ooh, yes, the medallion. Yeah, that's great. Which they send you the other plain one, too, in case you don't want the medallion, but why wouldn't you who, want it? Who doesn't want who the medallion? Want and I said to her, I said, I, I, I'm so thankful to be in a position to get a free guitar, but there's one thing. If it's heavy, I'm sending it back. Yeah. So that's all. I just want a regular, plain, bone stock, no bells and whistles, gold top Les Paul, mid eights, you know, eight and a half pounds. If it's if it gets, if it's up to nine pounds, I'm not, I'm gonna I'm, not, I'm gonna send it back. Yeah, yeah. I was seeing my buddy uh, from the band 
formerly of Buck Cherry, Keith Nelson, who's an insane collector, has all this stuff. I was in his studio one day. Every guitar is so light, I start asking if they were chambered. And he said, no, no. And I said, so what's the deal? He goes, the deal is, if they're heavy, I don't buy them. And I, I like that. So, <laughs> yeah. for, I mean, it's not like, like a Strat, but for Les Paul, it's a pretty good way. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, that's great. Totally so, manageable. Yeah, so last summer, this was my main because it was new. I wanted to get some mileage on it. And then I thought it wasn't fair for my special to be a backup. Sure. So they're kind of interchangeable. It depends uh, if there's capo stuff in the set. Yeah. Um, but I really think of the special and the gold top as two interchangeable main standard tuning Les Pauls. So what strings are you running? These are Dunlop 10s on the Les Pauls, and that's a pretty recent move down from 11s for me. Ooh, God. It's fun. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. I played 11s for a long time. My hands hurt just even thinking, thinking about, about 11s. 11s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the two Les Pauls. Uh, we can move over to the Gretsch family. Sure. Love so, the Gretsch family. This is a new jet. Ooh, uh, sexy. Courtesy of my pal Mike Taft, who is at Gretsch and Fender. Uh, also single coils. Oh, yeah. Um, so I noticed uh, there's a, a number of train songs half step down in E flat, and they happen to coincide with being a little bit more on the twangy, Gretschy. Thing. I never did too much research, but I had the theory that the uh, original guitar player, his Gretsch was his E flat guitar. Oh. And I haven't confirmed that, but, I, but uh, <laughs> uh, when we go to E flat songs, Jerry, the other guitar player, plays Tellies, and it seemed like a nice compliment. The half step down songs also happen to be twangy for some reason. Yeah. So we have Tellies and Gretsches for that. And uh, the great guitar player from Jackson Brown's band, Val McCallum. Sure. He was doing a session at my studio in LA and he had a Gretsch and I couldn't figure out what year it was. I thought it was some some highly collectible 60s thing. He said, you know what? Brand new off the rack, made in Japan Gretsch are making them better than they ever have. You don't have to soup anything up. You don't have to change anything. So this is a uh, bone stock uh, Japan uh, jet. Great. Now, How do you like the five speed? Does it stay in tune pretty well? Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Love you it. Know, it works. And I use it. I use it. I, I have a Sunburst, a plain top Les Paul at home, uh, 58, uh, an R8 with a Bigsby, and I miss not having it on this gold top. Yep. But I don't know. If, if you got two Les Pauls and you got a Bigsby on one, maybe leave the other one alone. Yeah. But I've been talking about it for about a year and a half now, if, how I want a Bigsby on the gold top. That's how it happens. You that, talk about it and then you can't stop thinking yeah, about right, it. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, right. So we'll go to Epiphone land now. This is pretty interesting. It looks just like a regular casino, Cherry Casino, but there are three songs in the set that are pretty well-known train songs where I sort of inherited this thing where you have to play acoustic and electric parts. And for a while we were trying it on the yeah. Gracie stand and nobody really liked that. And the previous guys had played guitars with piezo pickup and it was just this really kind of cheap uh, uh, white, uh, Telecaster and something about playing acoustic tones on a telly it was weirding me out and I thought yeah. let's and I'm a huge casino fan anyway I have a 64 330 at home oh wow and I thought you start with something that is acoustic maybe we'll have better a better chance here so there's a piezo pickup in it oh how cool it goes to a stereo jack and we split the regular signal and the piezo signal to two wireless packs oh wow so the piezo signal just goes to the acoustic di in the rack and i have no effects no control no processing over it at all and then uh, a signal from that is sent back to my pedal board and programmed on one of my switches to turn on and off so if i need to play a purely acoustic tone it's volume pedal down oh. piezo switch and it sounds like acoustic guitar electric only volume up, kill the piezo, or the blend of both. Yeah. And it's, it's actually critical because it's three of the best known songs and there isn't another guitar player to cover it. So people think it's on backing tracks because I'm coming out like, <laughs> and there's acoustic guitar blasting. Yeah. And, um, and then they did uh, a couple of years ago, a casino in this unusual finish that's like, it's not, you know, like the 60s Silver Fox finish. They brought it back in sort of grayish. It's like a matte 
satin. It looks like Sharpie. Hmm. And she sent me one, Ray from Ray Ann from Gibson, and that's on the truck to the other gig now. Yeah. But it's the same setup. Speaking <laughs> with Gretch, we have a Dobro. Ooh, that's, how cool. Uh, just on one, we do a little downstage segment of the show where yeah. Pat plays a cocktail kit and we like, you know, one mic harmonies and yeah. uh, it just had a rustic thing. I play slide on it and um, it's just, it's fun. I've never had a Dobro before. So cool. we were talking about this acoustic segment of the show. I called Mike at Gretch and, um, you know, their new stuff just straight off the rack production oh, model, inexpensive Gretsch stuff is, is really awesome. Do you know what pickup you have in that? No. Whatever came with it? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever okay. came with it. And it doesn't have the blend where you have the, like I know Jimmy Vivino has kind of like the piezo thing. You have a an electromagnetic pickup and an under saddle. Yeah. It doesn't have that. It's just one sound. It doesn't even go through my pedal board. It just sounds like a dobro. Yeah, works you know? great. Um, this is new to me. 1971. Glenn oh, Campbell wow. uh, Bullback. Oh wow, that's cool. And uh, yeah, this this um, was just before this tour, like on my way to the airport almost. Uh, we were a couple of things in the set list we were talking about seemed 12 string ish, and I kind of had a need for a, a new 12 string at home in my studio. I'd been on the market for a new 12, and I and I thought um, for live and just for like you know, it's just a, kind of a throwback for. A, yeah, I love you know? it. And, yeah. and uh, something about, you know, acoustic guitars with pickups live, it's always the compromise. Sure. But I think when they built these, the goal was always the amplified sound in the first place. Yeah. So, you know, with a plastic body, it might not be the most impressive thing acoustically. You're not going to put it up against, uh, you know, a Martin or something. Yeah. But, man, as soon as this came out, our front of house guy, our monitor guy, and my tech were all like, whoa, that sounds God. great. And so no, it actually gets used a few times in the show. That's like 50-year-old technology. Yeah. Wow. We did have one issue when the wirelesses a few years ago changed to digital. Yeah. You have to have uh, shielding um, or else they hum. So what we did was we just moved the pack really far up my back. So oh. I'm kind of shielding it. But if oh. it literally is like... <laughs> <laughs> but also, there's a volume. This is pretty convenient. So like playing electric guitar, I'm like waiting for the count in right there to, and then I'm, I'm out right away. Right. Uh, it's gotten a lot more use than I thought it would. We're doing, Jewel comes up during our set and we do uh, ABBA, Dancing Queen. Oh, As a mashup fun. into uh, Doobies, Listen to the Music. Oh, how great. And um, also uh, Nashville local Butch Walker produced our record and there's a song that he did a 12 string overdub on that's been in the set. So it's gotten a lot more use. I didn't want to be the guy shoehorning in a piece of gear like check out my ovation can we use it yeah, yeah, but it wound up in three songs in the uh, set so that's more than I, I bargained for um we have this is my epiphone frontier oh wow this is 64. boy how great um and so but this doesn't go uh like on fly dates or anything sure this will come home at the end of the tour and God, you have two just, Epiphones from 64. Yeah. That's well, so it, great. No, the 330 is a Gibson. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a 65 Epiphone Coronet single oh. P90. That's really cool. Yeah, how um, cool. I have a lot of P90 guitars at home. Yeah. Um, and this guitar, I mean, there's a lot of acoustic guitar songs, and Train have, like, a truck full of J45s. Yeah. Like there's two in my vault, two in Jerry's vault, two that are on the truck that go to the private gigs. Yeah. They have no distinguishing characteristics. They all have black straps. I don't even know which one I'm playing when one is handed to me. <laughs> there's just, and I think they get beat up from the humidity and they get sent back and they send new ones. And yeah, yeah. there's just always, wherever we go, a ton of J45s. Yeah. So just to have a personal acoustic to be distinctive sure. from that, I figured, you know, this wouldn't come out like, year-round on fly dates but for a big tour with a vault and trucks oh. it seemed like the move to to bring it out right my wife didn't agree <laughs> the front, the frontier should not be going out uh, like it's it's 40 shows when else that's when you should play your, yeah, your, your right. but right. that's an interesting thing about like good for you yeah yeah Yo, that's a beautiful guitar man. and then the uh 
J40. I like the way you just smash it right in. <laughs> plain old, plain old J45. So no, this one is A apparently. Okay. okay. Oh, no. But I think the way we did it was, there's a number of songs that are all pretty high capoed. Yeah. In the same vicinity. Yeah. And so the frontier gets those, and then this is only in one song that's an open finger picking thing, no capo. Yeah. And it's solid. It has a little more low end in the frontier, and it's just they're they're reliable. And these new ones have a a, a shielding. It compensates for the digital wireless, oh. so you don't have to do any oh, of the great. any Didn't of the funny that. business. And then it wouldn't be a train show without ukuleles. Got it. Oh, there we go. Um, and they started on uh, Fender ukes. Yeah. And Fender apparently their ukulele sales went up like three hundred percent when Hey Soul Sister came out, which sure. is now at a billion streams. Oh, God. So there will never ever be a train show without that. Yeah and um a billion it just seems like a funny um it's so small yeah. to worry about its tone or its quality it seems like you just play anything but when you're the band that has the song with a billion streams of the ukulele <laughs> they don't want to fuck around so they these are the godens and they go everywhere we go yeah. if we are playing a private party doing a three song set that's going to be one of the songs, <laughs> and there's going to be this and a spare. And I mean, we played in Hawaii where they sell ukuleles at 7 Eleven, <laughs> and we shipped our ukuleles because I think in the past, before I was here, there were ones that didn't stay in tune, ones that had feedback, ones that didn't sound good. Sure. So they landed on these uh, Godins, and I don't know how many of them there are, yeah. but everywhere. I go. There are a couple of these. There seem to be, and it's just on the one song. And so, did you play Oop before you got this gig? No, I know one song. On your <laughs> it's not standard tuned either. Yeah. So sometimes when people who know I, I came into this gig, they'll be like, "Oh, play Soul Sister." I'm like, "That's not the tuning." I don't know. But actually, uh, the bass player Hector, who's also a, an amazing guitar player, he was the one who told me because I was getting to know these guys over like zoom calls when i yeah. was sort of onboarding and learning material and i was like i don't mean to sound like an asshole but i i can't really figure out the shapes on the uke song he's like that's because it ain't standard tuning so he showed me the tuning uh and yeah. uh i i wouldn't be able to learn anything else in this tuning <laughs> so but you don't have to i don't have to yeah for now i don't have to yeah um and then we can go to Amps yeah, and yeah, let's, pedal board. Yeah, let's talk about amps and pedal boards. Great. Okay. So pedal board wise, uh, we can just go off of a still photo. I don't have to walk you over there. It's literally just the Line 6 HX and two Dunlop expression pedals. And it's interesting, we were just talking about how the transition from analog gear to modeling gear, different players are comfortable with different places in the signal chain. Like some guys want to be all analog, some guys will go full modeling. And for whatever reason, I came into this band, they're still using amps, which yeah. is great. Um, loud, but yeah. off stage. And, uh, but not a lot of analog pedals. And I, like all of us, I'm a pedal junkie who has a million pedals. Sure. I built pedal board after pedal board for a million gigs. And when I came in last summer, we did exactly that with an analog board with a lot of MXR and Dunlop and some vintage stuff and some boutique stuff. And what I came to find was that um, about 80% of train songs are really straight organic tones, like drives, delays, yeah. maybe a Leslie. And the other 20% could be anything. He could throw up, pull in a cover song or a deep cut or whatever. So you think you have all your stuff covered and then you need a chorus pedal one day for one song. Right. And to build that kind of pedal board, it's just unwieldy, it's big, and I don't know, things take a beating in the truck, it's hot out here, and our show has like, is very high momentum. The guitar changes have to be really fast. There's singing, there's harmonies on everything. And something about not looking down at a sea of different pedals uh, was something I was willing to try. And also because we do these fly dates, being able to have a, a replicated board, where there's an A and B identical board, and then there's a C board, which I can program at home, email, oh, the, email the file to our tech and our production manager and it goes on to all three boards so oh, anytime man. i make a change it's on if we we fly to san diego tomorrow for private things that i've adjusted throughout this tour will be reflected on the other pedal board there yeah. so that's pretty cool 
And it's kind of a sleeper model for a Line 6 because it's small. Yeah. I don't think they really consider it like a professional. It doesn't have an IEC cable thing. We had to do like a little adapter to make it clean, but I don't need a lot of stuff because I'm using real amps. So the, the final convincing was I watched a guy on YouTube who ABs like a Klon with the Klon in there and a vintage tone bender with the one in there. And I was like, come on, man, it's so, it's yeah. so close. So I just have one scene that's a, a tone bender fuzz, a Klon, a very neutral clean boost that's based on the Timmy, and then a memory man that's like my slap attached to the expression pedal that can take it down to like so short that it's sort of like an artificial double tracking sound. Yeah. I have a deluxe memory man at home that I run on a send and return out of Pro Tools, and it's the closest I've gotten to that Beetle ADT thing, because you can take the delay time down really, really short and turn up the modulation. And I, I love that kind of stuff, like Abbey Road, late Beatles oh, ADT, yeah. and like Neil Finn from Crowded House has that thing. It's like a way of getting modulation without a full-on chorus effect. Because yeah. chorus is such a statement, it's chorus, you yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> but any way you can get some wobble that's uh, a different way into modulation other than chorus is something I'm always chasing. So I have the Memory Man, if it's toe down, it's a slap. And if it's heel down, it's that really short, wobbly thing. And then there's uh, a Boss mo model of a DM2, the old purple DM2. Sure. And that's my long delay that I can tap. And that, I have the expression pedal tied to the feedback knob so I can do runaway stuff. So we have one um, transition right before Hey Soul Sister where we hit a chord and do the and it's feeding back while I change to the uke and then kill the delays right when we start the song. Uh, so great. moments like that are uh, dramatic. And then there's a Leslie on there that um, is fast, slow on the, on the thing. And it, what I liked is in the menu, it's a lot of effects that they, they went really deep. Like for a phaser, there's always going to be a, a phase 90 in there. Sure. But they also had a small stone, which is my favorite phaser. And there's always going to be a big muff, but I love a tone bender, and they happen to have that. And uh, for Leslie's, they had a simulator of a little Fender Vibratone, which is just doesn't have the horn. And that's really cool, too. So mm -hmm. I like the, the, the gear I would be using in the physical analog domain is represented there, and I didn't have to switch what my... Uh, you know, favorite kind of palette of sounds are because it's digital, it's still the stuff I would use, you know? Yeah. And the Leslie has a blend because I love Leslie with a straight amp and it's sort of sure. chorusing against the regular amp and most Leslie simulator pedals, it's just now you're in full yeah, Leslie. One so or the other. to be able to roll it to like 60%, um, it's really cool. It's great. Yeah. And then that on slow, 60% wet slow, again, is sort of uh, a modulation effect that's not quite chorus. Yeah. You know? So that's the main scene. And then there's song specific scenes where if I need to free up a switch for the piezo pickup, then we'll, we won't have Leslie on that scene. Or if we need, um, you know, a flange on a song, we'll just, I, I only, I, I like that I have six buttons yeah. to choose from. Oh yeah. And if you need, um, a chorus and a Leslie, maybe you should think about something else you don't need because it just keeps it kind of yeah. contained, you know, yeah. which is great. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so the final ingredient of the amp. So yeah. what are so you? So I'm playing, you'll, we'll get a shot later, a Top Hat King Royale, which I got 20 years ago when I got my yellow oh, special. Cool. And um, I don't know where Vox was making stuff at the time, but I remember I had rented a really cherry 60s AC30 to record a record and I was just all in on the Vox thing and new Voxes they were either unreliable or they were, had sold the company I mean now they're fantastic again but something about that time period sent me down uh, a, a hunt for a boutique uh, Vox style amp and I you know there's Bad Cat and Matchless and all of them and somehow I, I hooked up with the builder, Brian, who, who makes Top Hat, and I, he was in Orange County, I was in LA, and I drove down there with my special, and it was like, he was like, I'm not doing an AC30 hybrid with anything else. It just is the best AC30, and that's all he set out to do. And I toured it for 
you know, 10 years, but in a good case, I don't even think it's been re-tubed more than three times. Wow. It's just built like a tank. And right now we're on the non-top boost channel that's just volume and tone. It's an EF86 preamp. And it's just, um, you know, we're running so such long cable plus wireless. And I was a little bit OCD about that because I like the volume ups to work and I like everything to sound like you're plugged right in. And I think something about the gain structure of that EF86 channel, it just, I can plug a 10 foot cable straight in and the tone is pretty well matched. It's going wireless through an, an enormous loom. Yeah. And uh, so that amp's got a condenser and a 57 on it. That's what's out front. That's what's in the ears. And then this I just got is an AC4, but it's a 12. So it doesn't really sound like a toy. It's like, it, it rips. It sounds yeah. like Vox tone. So if uh, the top hat were to go down, we have that. I can also take it to the dressing room. It has a master volume, and you'd think a four watt amp is, uh, you know, but it's like a, it, 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 a champ sounds like a little champ, and yeah. I love that sound. Yeah. But it has that ratty eight inch speaker sure. thing, which is amazing, especially in recording. Um, but to get a low wattage amp that the cabinet and the chassis are still like a pretty like manly size, and there's a twelve in there, yeah. it doesn't have little amp tone. Sounds yeah. like an AC30, just quieter. And I got it because I was trying to make a play for having an amp back on stage. And the sound guy was like, he's fine with it because it's not loud, but it was a, a look thing because we have yeah. this sort of Soul Train sure. lighted riser thing. Yeah. It just wasn't going to happen. But um, we're so loud even off stage. It's fun because I, I think our sound guy doesn't like ISO cabs because they, you know, there's a, a reflection. You know, and gets in the microphone, the sound doesn't really sure. develop. So it's just out there in the wild, loud. Yeah, it just we, doesn't happen to be on stage. Before they told us to turn off, we heard it, and I yeah. can attest it is loud. Yeah. yeah. And Jerry's mattress is even louder. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so that, I, think I, I think I covered everything. This, this is from boot to bonnet. This is the, the rack of, of secrets. I, I thought I would never have a, a rig that I didn't know every component of myself intimately yeah but when it comes to wireless and switching oh. and routing i don't know what goes on in here yeah. stefan does you don't want to know, know no i don't i don't yeah but we we've taken the quick changes down to an art it's yeah. like one guy is doing a stinger and the other guy is changing like we we like to you know pat the singer likes to move fast so um and we don't over rehearse a ton because we play all these private shows, we're always kind of working. So we don't go and do a month of rehearsal for a big tour like this. We did like sure. a couple of days. Yeah. So Stefan and I are constantly looking at set lists, marking it, talking through, making sure we're ready for these quick changes. Because especially you have one pack off, one pack on. I don't want I can't think about that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, Plus that you're singing and playing. Singing and playing. That's what I like about this little board, you know. Um, I, I don't really miss the pedals because I can go home, use my pedals for writing and recording, and if I hit on something that is going to be in a train song, I can find it in the Line 6 menu and then send an email and it's on three pedal boards. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Taylor, right. thanks so much for joining us today, Thank you. man. It's an honor, man. Yeah, absolutely ours. Okay, now I'm with Jerry Becker of Train. Jerry, thanks so much for seeing thanks. us today, Thank man. Thank you, man. Are you kidding me? Come on. <laughs> All my guitar player friends, I watch your, I watch these, and they send, they send me all the best oh, ones. And now great. they're going to be teasing me, <laughs> and they're going to say everything that I did wrong, right? But yeah, thank well, you. Well, there is nothing wrong with that guitar. Let me hear about that sexy so, thing. So, I, I believe it's a '73, uh, wow. spe special limited edition. Yeah, that's so Do you know much about the, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen. So look at this overspray. It's all screwed up, oh. and that's that's why they. Okay, I got this on Craigslist in New York City the day we played Drive By on Letterman. Oh, really? Like 10 years ago, 12 years How ago. How cool. Like, he's like, I, I, want a guitar. I want this guitar. I saw it. I went to the guy's studio, and then he's like, you know, it's like 1500 bucks, I think. It was pretty cheap. And he's oh, like, yeah. I go, I'm going to play it on Letterman tonight. He's like, no, you're not. You know, so he, I didn't tell him who I was or anything. So yeah. this ended up, and then Sid from Letterman, remember that guitar yeah, player? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came over right away. I was like, what is that? What is yeah. That? So it's been like, it was at home for a bit. I took it on tour for a while, but then 
brought it back out this summer for the AM Gold Tour. Oh. It's my goldish guitar, right? <laughs> yeah, it actually does kind of fit with the whole... It's just the vibe. You know, Taylor's got some good stuff, so I wanted to kind of kind of bring out... Like, usually you use it at home, but it's yeah. nice to bring, you know. I've broken a few headstocks on tour. Not this one, so <laughs> luck, luckily, yeah, luckily this one, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, I use it on a few songs. Oh, so. that's great, beautiful. Yeah, the headstock is what kind of throws you because it looks right, 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 like a like it looks like a fifties, like a but like a the yeah, the whoever did it like screwed up. I don't know, whatever it is, right? They sprayed it raw. Right? I don't know. I love, or maybe it's just no. It's not supposed to be that color. It's supposed to be this color, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. I don't but know. But hey, it works. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. 50 years old. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, right, right. So am I. <laughs> yeah, 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 you do, you do. High mileage. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, so that's your main this is, go This is, yeah, I mean, in this set, I, sure. I probably play it on three or four songs. Uh, yeah, it's just been really, uh, you know, Butch Walker produced our record, yeah. and he's oh, the he's coolest, great. the greatest dude. You've done what, right? right? We, uh, Have you know I haven't, but, okay. uh, but, uh, but I know him, and I know he's, well, everybody knows he's his He's the greatest, and he did and a lot of really guitar tasty player. guitar parts on a record. Like, we, we tracked it as a band and everything, yeah. and then he comes in and makes things better. He produces yeah. the hell out of it. And then he, you know, like, once we get some of his sounds on there, I'm like, shit, I gotta recreate some of this. So yeah. uh, we use this on a lot of the Butch parts on, uh, on the record. You know? Great, so love it's, it. It's a good, yeah. It's a good guitar. I like it. I don't okay. have any issues. So. Well, that's a very that's gonna be a tough one to beat. That's, I don't, that's very... all I got. I'm done. You want to see my keyboards now? Yeah. <laughs> Should I put it back? You good? Yeah. Okay. Let's see more stuff. Okay. That's a cool start. Let's see where it goes. Well, this Ooh, is I another another New York. Uh, what was it? Thirty Street Guitars, right? Is like a seventy-eight. I think it's earlier than that. God. I think it's a seventy. Another 73 custom, Ooh, right? how cool. We did a Led Zeppelin record a few years ago. Remember we recorded that? <sighs> yes. So we did, it was for charity. Everyone's like, why did Train do a Zeppelin record, right? <laughs> but the truth is, you know, Pat's loved Zeppelin for years. Oh. And we always had it in the set. And then we did this killer, I thought we did a great version of it. Not, and we tried to do it note for note, did everything yeah. we could. And we weren't trying to recreate anything. But I didn't really have a Les Paul. And I only use this, you know, on that tour, but I bought it when we were playing in New York. So, oh. yeah, it's cool. It's, I don't know how much I'm using it, Wayne, this tour. I think it's, <laughs> it became a backup a little bit, but I still love it. I do <laughs> use it on a song or two, but it's just, it's just the coolest, oh, it's you know. it's so beautiful. Yeah. Is it, is it really heavy? Oh, Jesus or? Christ. Yeah. yeah, cause it looks. It's, it's. Oh it's, my God. <laughs> It's heavier than me. Oh God! <laughs> yeah, it's I, that's now I you know why I'm not playing it very much. I thought yeah. you were pulling it now. Down when you it's had to ridiculous. Do it. <laughs> oh God! Like I said, it's better to look good and to feel yeah. good, right? And it looks good, but it feels God. like shit. No. Yeah, that'll put it's you just in, heavy. That would put me in traction. <laughs> it's just definitely too much. Yeah, but I yeah. love it. I love how it looks. And, oh, yeah. I love it. So that was another New York by, uh, I don't know five, ten years ago, something oh, like that. Oh, how cool. But I'm into it. It's a good guitar. Yeah, that's fabulous. Uh, how am I going to beat that? No, let's I, see. I don't know, man. <laughs> so, are you familiar with these, these 339s? I have, I have that the guitar. The blue one or this one? I have that one. The, it's the, is it Tangerine uh, yeah, first? Yeah, that's right, yeah. I have that guitar, I love it. I love this guitar. So, I'm not a big dude and I can't do the 339, or the 335, so this yeah. was perfect. It just kind of, but this shows up on a lot of when we tracked Hey Soul Sister, Jimmy, our previous guitar, the original guitar player, he played it on a 335. Yeah. So I try my best to recreate what the guitars were recorded on and yeah. you know, use those in the set. Uh, we did that at Sunset Sound. I remember oh. putting the guitar. How like, cool. B3 in the hand, like Greg Wattenberg's great producer, he came down and finished off that song. And I just remember being in there in this crazy place. And, and then Historic. Jimmy, I think Jimmy was playing the 335 through a plug-in. It wasn't even like he was using some amp farm thing or something. And I'm like, really? We're at the studio. We're not, we're not using an amp out there. Yeah. Maybe they were. I don't know. Maybe we were tapping delays with that or something. Yeah. But that's yeah. the most old school studio. That's right. That's right. In LA. So this is. I use this on Soul Sister live. Oh. Just, just kind of the big fat chords at the end. Those and are great because they're unlike a 335, which is basically plywood right. that's all a saw i mean that's carved is that right you can tell me about this i don't they're, know they're that's a carved top and a carved back yeah gibson yeah, gave i mean they're so great they've been great to us for years they gave me this and the i'll show you next well, jerry you're a huge band no oh, they're so huge. sweet I, i'm you're always like i'm like i'm not into like anybody giving me anything because i was like i owe them something you know yeah so i don't really go through that but they're just like yes yeah 
you know, keep, yeah. keep it. You're great. You know, thanks. You know, play it whenever you can. Send some pictures. But they gave me this, That's and fabulous. the same day they gave me this, they gave me. We use J45s all the time. Just, yeah. Oh, we, oh, we, we heard. We did <laughs> we did tailors for a while, and we love them. But J45s have been cool. So they gave me this too. Wow. So custom whatever. Yeah. What is that? Custom finish? shop wine. It's like a wine. I think it's called okay. Wine, but. That's, I've never seen a. Oh, yeah, that's I great. love it. Beautiful. Yeah. This guitar, it was sitting home too, and and I think some of my crew, my great uh, JMO, our sound guy, he's like, "You can bring that out." You know, they, he gets mad at me. I didn't bring my Strat out this summer. I mean, yeah. he's so mad at me for it because he had a '70s Strat that he loves. But I had too many guitars for the yeah. keyboard player. I had too many guitars. <laughs> But Jamo said he was mad at me for that. Uh, but this, this I got the same day as that, and oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's just kind of bright. It has a different tone than the other J45. So I think I'm playing this right in the acoustic set now. Yeah. With this little acoustic part of the set. Yeah. But the cool, can I jump quick? Is that oh, okay? Of course, yeah. I don't want to take as much time as Taylor, because <laughs> <laughs> we got a show tonight. You yeah, know? yeah, right. That's right. So, you guys you know this guitar, right? Oh, yeah. Is this a B25 or is it an LG2? You tell me. I think it's a B25. Okay. We'll leave it to the nerds uh, yeah. watching at home. They'll someone <laughs> someone <laughs> told me it was a, yeah, a, a LG2. But hey, anyways, wait a you got a great tech right over there. Well, what I, do you think, think? I think it's a B25, right? <laughs> I think that's what we figured out. I just, we're in Nashville. I had to tune it up today for the yeah, Nashville tuning. I love that. So that's the Nashville tuning. Yeah. Okay, for those of you at home, what you, you want to explain you, it? You, yeah, yeah you'll you do better than me. Buy a set of 12 string, uh, a 12 string set, but don't use the low set. Well, they set. sell they sell them like this now. Oh, it's do they really? said Nashville. You can buy them as Nashville. Oh, okay. oh yeah, wait yeah. a minute. Don't they have it? Well, there we go. Don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. So, yeah, it's these are the same. Yeah. That's your normal E and B. Sorry, look at the wrong one. Yeah. And everything else is an octave higher. Yeah. So it sounds like. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a 12 string. If you took away the regular guitar. Yeah, it's like, it's super uh, like, oh. it's mo mostly studio. It doesn't really translate as well here. Yeah. I used it in the acoustic set for a little bit, but you have to have other guitars with you. Sure. And you got to kind of fill it out. And and it's funny with the tuning sometimes. So I, I love it. I want it on the road. Yeah. Uh, but this, this, yeah, this exact, this is a 66, sorry. Ooh, 66. how cool. And somebody, if you could ever find it, Someone named Sue Sanderson, Dremel, okay. <laughs> her name into it. So Sue, thanks for the yeah. guitar. Sue, Jerry's got your old guitar. Do you know Time Warp? Uh, I think down in LA, Time Warp guitars. I uh, think that's where I got this. Yeah. Uh, but again, I don't think I ever spent more than two or three thousand bucks on a guitar. Yeah. But they've all gone. You know how this oh, like cars. Crazy. Everything's going crazy. Yeah, it's like real estate. It's like. I, yeah. I, yeah. You, I, I, oh I can't. really? I don't know. No. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been. But this guitar. Yeah. yeah. I've always loved it. I think uh, Gary Brower, you know Gary, the he's like Journey's Tech, everybody's tech in the Bay Area. I'm from, I live in San Francisco, Berkeley, so he set this up for me, re redid all the, you know, I, oh, yeah. I still have all the original stuff, but he redid it, put the pickup, did everything in, so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he fabulous. did a great job, yeah. Yeah, great. But the funny part is, <laughs> when I bought this, it's, an, what, 60 years old, almost, right? And it didn't have any of this on it. Oh, that's all you. That's all. <laughs> Good for you, You can man. tell by my strum. Yeah. Right, like I feel bad that I was Sue like, Sue oh. was babying yeah. it all those years. <laughs> right, <laughs> it was Sue's baby. What are you doing yeah. in Sue's guitar? <laughs> yeah, you can see by my strum pattern, everything I did was like right here. But anyway, yeah, it's funny that thing. you would think that, yeah, oh, it was like that for now. <laughs> I did it the last 10 years, but I've never worn a hole. I know this guy, Taylor's pretty, yeah. yeah. You go through guitars? No, no, no not like that. Uh, who plays like that? I don't, apparently, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Taylor does. <laughs> oh, he bought it looking like that. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So, yeah, the yeah. B oh, that's great, B25, man. I love this guitar. And yeah, Sue Sanders' son. I, think yeah. that, right? <laughs> uh, I got a couple J45s. They're just doubles. They're yeah. just the tobacco. Is this tobacco? Right? Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Or is it? Is that right? That was called. So yeah, I have two. We use that for the spare. Two of these. It's just a spare. And then I, we've gone through a few nylon. Like Taylor makes one a couple. And none of them really sound great live. So. Yeah. This might be the only one that doesn't look great but sounds good. I mean, it, it's you've seen these, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I use this on all the capo, capo. 
on all the 50 ways to say goodbye and all that you know that right. song like it's got that when it's in yeah. tune yeah i love you get the whole flamingo thing going on hector taught me really no his family's all, everybody is really great and so no, I don't know if that even sounds like how we did it on the record, but I just, it I need that. Fooled me. It works, yes. <laughs> but this translates live, the oh. sound of this. Doesn't sound amazing when you're just sitting in a room with it, because yeah. it's this big, you know? Sure. But it's been really good, wouldn't you say? And then we played on two songs, right? Uh, I played on a new single that's got the same kind of flair, so. Yeah. Yeah. But it's oh, cool. that's great. It's all right. I don't mind it. Yeah. So is that about right? Did I talk through? Oh, and what you have about one the one lonely Telecaster back oh, there? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The one Fender in the bunch. <laughs> That's so weird. I usually have more. Fen I got Strats and a couple of these at home. Yeah. But so I bought this well, off my friend Brandon because he didn't like it. But it's a, just a '52 reissue from about ten years ago. Yeah. But it's perfect. I think we used on the Save Me San Francisco record, Jimmy and we we used just Tellys. I think was the only guitar. I don't think it's so. Like I try to strictly do, if it's love, this is my E flat guitar. Yeah. And that's it, right? So yeah. it's just, yeah, it's yeah. definitely, I love this guitar. I should get it more in the set, but it's you know, tuned I down. I think Fenders do better tuned down. Really? Than, I, I mean, well, to me, it seems like. That's, I, I mean. I mean, I'm probably wrong, often wrong. <laughs> oh, wait, where's the SG? Oh, can I show them that real quick? I got a, I got a 10 year old SG. So this is a, thank you, Brandon, for this guitar. <laughs> uh, this SG, we have a song called Fake Flowers, right? And it was recorded with a baritone. So I took this all the way down to C sharp. Wow. And it holds. Wow. I don't know. Okay, then I strike but, what I said about Fender's working better that low. You can see, I mean, the action's high. So it's oh kind of like a, you can't really. Boy, that action is right up there, man. But I use this forever. I used it for, on me, Virginia, for years. Oh. Uh, but then just oh, yeah. this summer, I definitely just became my baritone guitar. What, what year is that? I Do you remember? 10, maybe 2010. It's not, it's yeah. not, I don't know. Oh, it says it right on the back, doesn't it? No? Uh, 2010. I don't know. I yeah, can't. it does. I take one no, of those vintage 2010s. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's the uh, golden age. It's. <laughs> I gotta tell you, man, it's it's been probably one of the most consistent guitars I've ever huh. had. God, that's like surprisingly, I it w I would say the the uh, special is my favorite, but I have to rely on like I rely on this. It yeah. flies with us to every show, right? This flies in our fly pack with like the Les Paul. So you know how it goes. You got fly packs for private. Sure. You got a lot of private shows. So this this is almost at every show. It's probably been at every train show in the last 15 years. Wow. Yeah. Surprisingly consistent. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I like this guitar. Love it. So for a keyboard player, that's a lot of garbage. <laughs> yeah. Right? Real, real quick story on this. Do you know these, right? The Gitalalis? Yeah, like Pat, a... Yeah, Pep, he plays this in the set. But this little guy, I went to his studio a couple years ago up to Pat's in Seattle, and, and he's like, hey man, what do you think of this? And he writes on these just super easy because he you know he, he, I think ukulele confuses people with the missing the strings sure but with this he can just sit there you know so this made it on the whole record the new record this really? actual and then he uses it live it's on like three songs on so that. what's he tuned to it's the same just standard tuning so imagine this is just a capo on the fifth fret oh, okay so here's here's your that's your F okay. instead of a, instead of your C chord so everything's up a fourth okay cool. is that right fourth yeah that's an F yeah. Oh, it's normal then. Yeah. yeah so this yeah. this would be an F chord. Yeah. So an E would be an A. If you played an E. Right. That's right. E, That's right. Okay. Yeah. A a. Okay. So. Cow cool. And it's got yeah. a fishman. In it. It's got a fishman in it. I think we have two out here right now. Yeah. One of them sounds better than the other for some reason. Yeah. But one of them plays better. <laughs> so yeah, it's so strange. Yeah. You know? Right. Any piece of gear, just something is a little funny. But. Uh, this was a big part of the new album, huh. surprisingly. I think his is still at home, but we ordered a couple for tour. Yeah. So, get a Lely's, people. Yeah. They're really very cool. Very cool. Yeah. 
So what are you the, doing? Sorry, okay, so your pedal board is up on stage, but what yeah. are you running essentially? Can you kind of tell us the basic well, flow of it? Yeah, it's it's just this fractal. What is it? FX8. <laughs> FX8. I've had for a, yeah. I know. I have to ask him. You got uh, great tech. He's wonderful. <laughs> okay. You'll be fine. It yeah. It just basically goes through there, and I have a, another uh, line going to my Leslie, so I can access that too. But it's just, I have a wall pedal up there and all my uh, uh, modulation and delays are done in there. Yeah. So I had pedals for years like everybody, but we do so many fly dates that it was like, just the consistency, Jamo was like, let's try this, you know? Yeah. So we, we got those and they've been super great. You know, you can tap it out, it sounds awesome. And, and it's uh, all kind of in the frack. Everything's there, but I, I don't use any of the amp simulation. I still use the matchless, so. Oh, great. This is, yeah. What, That's what matchless is that? I got it. We were on tour with uh, Maroon Five, and my I had an orange amp, or I had something, and it shit the bed. And then James is amazing from you know. The, did you do one oh, with yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, he's the coolest. He's like, come here, and he immediately called his guy, and I had an amp like the next day. Yeah, I mean, that's a good friend. Great dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he doesn't like me anymore. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. He he hooked me up with those guys, and honestly, I had an amp for the next show. And you've had that like a decade. It's been. <laughs> So I had a tech named Josh for years, and he kind of assembled everything. And Josh is great, and so I have to thank him for putting this all together. But he put it in here, and it's been it's been in there for years. <laughs> I don't switch my amps. I'm a keyboard player. No. <laughs> no, I love this amp. That's my old this this AC30. I think is from the early '90s. Yeah. And it's just a backup, but it sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm into that. I don't think I've ever had to switch it, right? That's my recollection. Yeah, I mean. As far as I know, yeah. But that's that's the the chain is pretty simple. Yeah. Do you want to look at the pedal board? Or you know, you already you already take pictures of that. You don't yeah, have to do yeah. it. Don't we leave. Gotta, don't leave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's all it is. is Fractal all your effects, mm -hmm. not using the amp simulation, that's going right. to the matchless. That's right. For a and guitar. a boatload yeah. of gray guitars. <laughs> Sheesh. But what's kind of cool? This so I, I have a my keyboards up there are funny because it runs through MIDI so as I as I turn everything all my effects change all the songs change by title through you know my oh, foot switch because right. I'm always doing something so I have to go like this so it's it's kind of an easy way to do it yeah because it used to be we have a click track on most of the songs that used to come from that but uh, too many times they would start a song and my sound would go away Oof. because it wasn't programmed from the That's last song the nightmare it's a nightmare so yeah. i said can i be in control of my own switches you know <laughs> please so yeah it's weird to have midi with guitar stuff but it's, it's just for switching yeah you know but it's great it's been it's been a really good consistent like rig yeah i think yeah well jerry got it's gotta be so much fun playing those songs I every get, night it's it's yeah i'm i'm very lucky I'm very happy yeah, yeah fabulous. i mean i get i get a couple key like the Meet Virginia beginning, get a little guitar oh. part. I get to do that. I get to do the beginning of drops. I get to do all these like moments, Huge. you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Because I can't trust Taylor to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, he's the best. I'm, and, and Hector's so consistent. He's a great singer. You're going to meet Hector, right? Uh, yeah. I think, well, yeah. it depends on if we time. We have time. Okay. They're, uh, they're telling us you guys have a show. Oh, <laughs> we have a show tonight. I know. It's one of these quiet stages because we're kind of downtown, but not Oh, really, you were right? right downtown. Yeah. This yeah. is, I mean, they're... Yeah, that is you were right. downtown, and you live here. Oh yeah, yeah. Cool. We're yeah, we're we're all uh, Chris and Perry. We're all locals. Right on. Sick one fivers. Mm, I got yeah. it. Well, this is great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for Jerry. Man, thanks, I man. Had so much fun. Hey, what a pleasure to meet you. Oh man, now my friends can send me my own link. Yeah, <laughs> if it makes the cut. Right? Yeah. Oh, oh, you're in there, buddy. With those guitars, right. yeah. Good, absolutely. good, good. Well, hey, thanks, Wayne. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Cheers. All right, everyone. Chris Keys here. John Bollinger had to step out because that dude plays gigs all the time. It's Nashville. It's Music City. But I'm joined now by Hector. Hector, thank you so much hey. for talking gear with us. Yep. Hector's the bass player for Train. Looks like you've got a fine, mean machine here on your shoulder. Tell us about this bass. Yeah, this is a, a 1960 uh, P bass that I recently acquired. Actually, I've been wow. looking for an early 60s P bass for many, many years, and it just so happens that right before the tour, I mean days before the tour, okay. uh, a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, I have somebody who's looking to, you know. So it's a real deal, 60. It's a real 1960. Sid yeah, the only thing CDs. about it is that it's it's a refinish. Okay. But it's refinished to, you know, the same specs as what it would probably look like. But I'm not really that picky about finishes anyway. Yeah. Kind of like the, the distressed sort of relic look. And that way, if I bump into it like a corner or something, then I'm like, eh, no big deal. Yeah, right. And yeah. I'm sure maybe 
brought it within a little bit more of a, an affordable range comparatively to a 1960. Yeah, definitely. You know, because yeah. like that takes down the value when it's less original. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I've, I've never really been a collector, so to speak, and I, I, I have a lot of guitars and basses at home. Um, but they're not like collector pieces. They're all okay. just like, oh, this is funky and weird and plays amazing. So I'll, yeah, you know, I'll take it home kind of thing. Um, and if I like one, I usually go find a second one just in case that yeah. one gets, gets messed up or something. That's why I don't really worry about, you know, them being in mint condition or something. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I like it. I, I mean, I love this bass because I was like, well, it's exactly what I wanted. Slab board, it's in great shape, original frets. I mean, wow. what's not to love about it? So um, yeah, I've been playing it on this whole tour and it's, Pretty much. I was gonna say, what's your experience been kind of getting to know this instrument? I mean, it feels like I've been playing it a long time. Just Somebody be, has. Because, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this, there's, a, there's a long story behind it, uh, but I don't know if it's true. Uh, basically, some guy was, uh, uh, he owned a music shop in Tacoma, Washington. Okay. And he had, he had a bunch of gear that he basically pawned at a pawn shop um, to get like a loan or something. He had some kind of gambling problem or something. Mm. I don't really know who it was or the, the exact story, but the pawn shop had acquired a, a, the base after the guy died. Wow. Uh, the family was like, just keep it. We don't want anything to do with it. So he was kind of surprised and was like, all right, I, I will. And he had it for several years. And he was like, I, I don't really play bass. Yeah. But I've had it in my house for years, just going like, wow, look at that thing. It's cool. Yeah, it's old. <laughs> yeah, and then one day recently, he was like, I just have no use for it. Uh, so he reached out to the guy who refinished it. And his name is Joe Riggio. And he does excellent work in Tacoma, Washington. And actually, he gets stuff shipped to him all the time. Um, and uh, I called him. And I was like, do you know of anybody who's got a 1960 P bass? And he's like, actually, wow. I do. Uh, I've got a story for you. It was a weird thing, yeah. So then, uh, then I just basically came along and said, "Is it is it okay if I check it out?" And it's been kind of it's been my number one ever since. Cool. Um, but it's hard to play anything else after playing this. Yeah. You know, it's like playing your your top of the line guitar, keyboard, bass, drums, whatever. I'm sure. Once you try something else, you're like, oh, it's just not as good. It's not that. Uh, but for many years, I was basically using um, a store, but like just you know, like a Guitar Center. Off the, bass, rack. off the rack kind of thing um, but I've done that for years and years I've basically picked them up and been like yeah, that's cool you know it does the job but this one uh, for some reason it just played and resonated amazing so I've had this fly dates for tours I mean I basically use this and it's I think it's a 62 reissue okay um, so it's only about I don't know six years old or something but it's amazing it's better than some of my other vintage bases that I have at home and I don't bring all my vintage stuff out, but yeah. that one, I was like, I can't not bring it. Yeah, right. You know? So that's... Now, have you always been more uh, leaning towards the P side of things when it comes to the Fender JP equation? No, actually, I was a jazz bass only guy. Okay. Yeah, I started playing jazz bass. It was my first bass, and I still have it somewhere around here, out here with us. Um, but I was playing a lot of jazz gigs, and then I was playing a bunch of funk stuff, and then I was playing rock and blues and session stuff, so I was just kind of covering all my basses. Mm -hmm. I just, my frame of thought was you can make a, a jazz bass sound like a P bass if you turn off the bridge pickup, but yeah. you can't make a P sound like a jazz. I mean, you can yeah. with frequencies and, you know, playing in a certain place, but it's just like, I don't need another bass. One's good. Yeah. So I did that for like 10 years. Dang. And uh, then I kind of, I started playing with these guys and I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of P bass, like specific tones that they use. And I wasn't really like into pick bass that much, um, except for if I was playing a Hofner or, you know, mm -hmm. something unique like that. Um, so I was like, I, I got to get a P bass just to cover both bases. Yeah. Uh, bad joke. Uh, thanks for that, by the way. So yeah, I mean, I just kind of decided I was going to go with a P bass and see what it, what it, you know, what I could do with it, and it universally just fit everything that we were doing. Uh, covered all of the, you know, sounds that Train has acquired throughout the years because mm. I've been, every record has changed, you know. So um, every song actually is pretty specific. Yeah. So I started recording. Um, with a P bass and tracking and, 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 and uh, touring with the P bass with these guys. And then we started writing records or recording records that I wanted to do more, more Paul McCartney stuff. And there was this really cheap Italian knockoff bass of a, a knockoff of a Hofner in the studio. And we always record the same studio. So I was like, hey, is that bass still there? Because I want to use it. Yeah. And we tracked some Christmas songs, shockingly. That was like, it just fit right in the mix. So. I contacted Hofner and I'm like, I wanna, I wanna check out more of your bases. I know nothing about Hofner's. Yeah. So help me out. Uh, so I went to Hofner and they started schooling me on all of their different uh, 
all their different styles and, and the, the way they're made and, and the, where they're that made. That is such and, a compact body for, for a bass. I always think, of, you know, I, I tend to think of the J and the P and they're bigger. bigger. Yeah. Yeah, it is a little tricky. I mean, if you're in a studio, it's a lot easier to put on your knee and, you know, sort of yeah. pluck away. But when I started playing it live, I was like, oh, I have to, like, actually hold it a different way. And um, and we just started using more of the Hofner on everything. So mm. last, I want to say, three records we put out were most of this wow. uh, on it, this specific bass. And it's a gold label that, that uh, they did, a, like, a limited edition run. And they didn't want me to bring it out because they knew it was going to start getting cracked and everything. Oh. But I was like... You know, if I have it, I might as well use it, right? And uh, this one is one of the Ed Sullivan, you know, series. Uh, it's It's got a different tone to it. It still has the staple pickups, but it has a little bit more of a clunkier sound. So if I'm really trying to get the pluck sound, it's uh, that's the vibe. And wh what about for strings as we're going through these instruments? I'm pretty much using flats on the Hofners. Makes um, sense. Uh, and I'm using rounds on the P's because I tried going to flats. I've tried different pickups pickup configurations with different rounds and flats. These are rounds because I can roll off the tone and get it closer to a flat, but I can't really make a flat pop as well without having to do a bunch of EQing. So yeah. I'm used to rounds. I like the rounds. I love the flats for the Hoffs because uh, they're already a pretty unique sound. And with the flats, it's kind of perfect. Yeah. It's sort of like, that's the sound. Yeah. It takes you, you back to like 66. Yeah. So if you want to stray away from that sound, uh, good luck. But it, it really kind of is made to have that flat sound. And what about uh, brands, just so people are clear? Uh, for strings, I use Daddario's. Okay. And I, I tend to gravitate towards 45 to 100s. Okay. So it's like a lighter gauge. Um, for the Hoffs, I've been doing chromes, and I think I'm doing all the same gauge, 45 to 100s. Um, but I always have a, a Strat or, a, a, you know, an electric out because... I see, I see the two six strings here peeking out. Yeah, so, I mean, I, guitar is my first instrument. I started playing classical guitar when I was like 10. Then I ventured into flamenco guitar, which is really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're trying to do it traditional. Um, so I was doing that for many, many years while I was playing bass and, and, and trying to be... Stevie Ray Vaughan and Eddie Van Halen and everything. So, yeah. I mean, at the same time, I was on just bass? like, yeah, I was just no on guitar. <laughs> so I figured uh, my brothers play guitar as well. I might as well, you know, be the guy that steps down and plays bass for a little while, just temporarily until we can get a bass player. Then I'm back to jamming on guitar. Yeah. And that never happened. So I just kind of stuck with the bass and played guitar the whole time. And so now we have this song uh, called Cleopatra. Cleopatra sings, and there's flamenco guitar parts on it. And you know, Jerry's already playing a guitar part. Taylor's playing another guitar part. So there was nobody playing flamenco if I'm on bass. So I, I invented a flamenco slash bass hybrid. Oh, cool. Where it has, uh, you know, that I can do the high notes on the nylon string. But then I can do the bass parts. Wow. That's creative. That's a way to think on your feet. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is that it was inspired because we did a song called Singing Alone on the record. And I was using a bass six, those Fender mm. six string basses. The gauge of them is really weird and thin and tiny. Yeah. So I took those and I just threw them on this flamenco guitar and I experimented with different gauges. And I'm like, that's too floppy. That doesn't sound right. Uh, but I finally got it to sound like a bass. Yeah. So it sounds a little like a Hofner when you plug it in. And then I still get all these. Kind of with the com uh, compact scale, it reminds me just hearing it off the, the instrument top is uh, like a Mustang bass, like a short scale. Yeah, exactly. A little clunker. Exactly. So we use it every night, and uh, it seems to be doing pretty good on it. So I was like, best of both worlds. Now I can play guitar and bass yeah. in the same song. I think I recognize that uh, Yamaha on the Yeah, yes, here. it is. Okay. It is a Yamaha. It's their flamenco model uh, from 10 years ago. I've had it for a long time. It's just been a guitar sitting in my house. And then I was like, I'm going to try something. And see what happens. Roll the well, dice, cool. and it does seem to work out. I mean, even plugged in, it sounds, it sounds pretty great. Color me impressed. Yeah. Now what you should do is try to hand that to your guitar playing friends. And don't tell them anything about it and just, <laughs> hey, try this out. Yeah, no, I'm actually going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to make one from scratch. I mean, not me, myself, but I have a guitar player friend of mine, or he's a maker, actually, a guitar maker here in Nashville, uh, who's going to try to make a specific thing like that. He's, he's really into making custom guitars that are who's unique the, that way. the builder? Oh, his name is Manuel Delgado. Yeah, over in East Nashville. Yeah, yep. exactly. He's coming here today, actually. Oh, cool. Going to be here soon, so. 
He's what? gonna make me one, and uh, I think it's gonna be kind of something that sticks around forever. Oh, cool. Just, you know, so I can do both things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, transitioning here, we kind of already heard it, but uh, you're using Mesa. I am using Mesa. I was, I was using, uh, I've gone through everything from Ampeg uh, to the Aguilar stuff. I just kind of tend to gravitate towards the Mesa because it's super, um, it's diverse. I mean, like I can play anything through it. I mean, I've been in metal bands and it sounded great. I've yeah. been in, you know, blues rock bands, jazz stuff, and it always just delivered. So I've, been, I've stuck with Mesa for, you know, pretty much 20 years. And then you got uh, mic'd up here to the right of it is uh, one, one fifteen. Yes. Okay. I have a I have a full stack where I have a four ten and a single fifteen, uh, but man, with these size venues, I don't really need it. Yeah. I mean, we're running ten million watts. It's either something like, you, like that. You get plugged in or not plugged in. You get mic'd up and through the PA, or else you just have that going and you're not even in the mix. Right. So it's like right. you might as well just get mic'd up. Exactly. And uh, and I learned my lesson for a long time, just like cranking it up on stage. This feels good to me. It's like. <laughs> Not everybody's loving it out there, especially our sound guy. <laughs> you can see him, that's the dirty look you're getting over oh, yonder. Yeah. No, I, I definitely just, it would be this nod and I'm like, come on, but I like it. And it's like, no, well, you have to think of the big picture. So I scaled back and it's not even that loud. Obviously you just heard it, it's, yeah. you know, pretty quiet, but just to get enough of the uh, sound to, you know, differentiate it from a DI, so. Well, speaking of differentiating things from a DI, let's talk about pedals and we'll move over to the stage. Great, yeah. Hector, we are about your uh, pedal board. Talk yes. to us about it. You got some fun treats on there. So, I mean, because my background is, is guitar first, then bass, uh, I, I kept on trying to like, I would plug in my electric guitar into my bass pedal board and my whole rig, and if it sounded good with an electric guitar, then my bass would sound good. Yeah. So I kept that vibe sort of going with pedals too. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, every time I would get like a bass overdrive or bass distortion or bass octave or something, it never really sounded quite right. There was always this sort of like farty element where it would just, low frequencies would just not really work well. Okay. So I, I pretty much have um, a, a MXR Phase 95, which is your run of the mill phase pedal. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've tried bass phasers and it's just, they're too washy where it doesn't really get the clarity. So mm. I'm using that as, it's mostly a guitar pedal. Uh, the Cali 76 is an EQ pedal, uh, sorry, it's a compressor pedal. The, um, and it's made by Origin FX, and it's basically meant to sound like an 1176. Mm. And it does, actually. I've played a, an 1176 in my home studio. This is the pedal version of it. It's incredible. Now, is um, that something you keep on a lot? I do it sometimes, um, but like consistency-wise, I mean, I try to play harder when I need to and softer when I don't. Okay. And that's only something when I'm going high register, low register, and it's you're going to hear the difference a little too much. Okay. So just to kind of even it out. Um, I have a carbon copy pedal just for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. The EQ pedal's for the flamenco bass hybrid guitar that I have just because it's, uh, it's you know, not really balanced all the way. So I have to like compensate with the EQ mm -hmm. pedal. Um, tuner, volume, and then the two channel switch in case I need to do, when I'd switch from the flamenco guitar to a, a bass. Um, bass driver by Digitech is actually the best bass driver I've owned. Wow. I don't know why, it just sounds better than any other bass driver I've tried, and I have a whole thing of bass drivers. If you want to buy some bass driver pedals, I have some for sale, by the way. <laughs> Check out my reverb site. Um, the Sans Amp uh, Tech 21, I never really was a fan of uh, when I was playing it through a jazz, uh, playing, playing a jazz bass through it. It just has such a unique sound. Yeah. Um, but from, for the early train stuff, they were, they, like, Brendan O'Brien loved using that specific sound um, with flat wounds on a P bass. And so for some of the older train stuff, I use it absolutely. And it's like, it sounds like the record kind of thing. That's a cool combination of elements. Yeah. And then a Holy Grail, um, you know, reverb pedal for uh, the flamenco, but I'll use it sometimes when I'm doing some pick bass, um, you know, ha needing a little bit of reverb to it. And then I have a low octave, which, you know, just gives you the low octave. Now that one actually, because uh, a lot of times people will say about uh, bass octaves or bass uh, frequency based pedals, yep. they kind of don't don't give what they're advertising. This right. one does. This one does because it has like this uh, this growl effect, and I think it's a subharmonic frequency that mm. that's in there. But I don't really use it because I need to hear the absolute low octave. I'll only use it if I'm doing high register stuff. That way, it sounds like. Instead of getting uh, like the pog pedals where it has a high octave and a low octave, the high octave always sounded a little uh, synthetic. So I'll do high register and get the low low uh, octave on with the growl just a tiny bit on, and it 
it's really clean. It's nice. Okay. I mean, it still has all that oomph too. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of it. I don't. And then I you get the volume pedal, or is that yeah, volume? Yep. Just the volume pedal. It also doubles as an ex uh, expression pedal or EXP pedal. Where if I had a tremolo or something that I wanted to control the phase or something like that, okay. that would work with that. So I'll use that with a Leslie pedal sometimes if we're doing some really weird shit. <laughs> well, that's rad. Hector, I appreciate you making the time to talk gear with us. Yeah, man. Thanks. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you. for But John Bollinger, who's down there somewhere on Broadway playing for Hector, for yep. Train. It's Chris Key's Premier Guitar. Thanks.